Title, 300 Bravehearts The Unyielding Spirit of Thermopylae 1. A Land Divided The land of ancient Greece was a kaleidoscope of city-states, each boasting its unique flair. Athens celebrated democracy and theosophy. Corinth was known for its wealth, while Sparta prided itself on its martial prowess. Despite their individualities, they shared common Greek traditions, religious beliefs, and a love for competitions, event in the Olympic Games. However, unity was often elusive. Power struggles, territorial disputes, and egos meant the city-states spent as much time fighting each other as they did external threats. But as the old saying goes, when the enemy is at the gates, internal quarrels are put to rest, and beyond Greece's horizon, such an enemy was rising. Persian Empire, vast and powerful, was spreading its influence, swallowing lands and cultures. Their thirst or conquest was unquenchable, and Greece's disjointed states were an attractive target. The impending storm of war was palpable, and the Greeks knew they needed to stand together or face subjugation. 2. The might of Persia approaches. Persia's king Terxes was not just a monarch. He was an embodiment of divine power. Under his command was an army, so vast that it drank rivers dry and stretched beyond sight. Their shields gleamed under the sun, and their battle cries echoed like thunder. Persian military machine was not just about numbers. Their immortals, an elite unit of 10,000 soldiers, were fearsome and ruthlessly efficient. Persians had a blend of cavalry, infantry, archers, and war elephants, making them versatile in combat. But it wasn't just the military might that made Persia formidable. Their spies and network of informants kept them updated on enemy movements and weaknesses. They could turn allies against each other, using gold or threats, ensuring that the battlefield was often won even before the fighting began. 3. King Leonidas and his band of Spartans In the heart of the Peloponnesian Peninsula lay Sparta, a city-state unlike any other. Their entire way of life was built around warfare. Babies were inspected at birth those deemed weak were left on Mount Tegutos, while the rest were molded into warriors. They started military training at a tender age, learning to endure pain, hunger, and fear. King Leonidas was a product of this system. Warrior king, he was as shrewd as he was brave. When messengers from Persia arrived with a demand for earth and water, symbolic of submission, Leonidas' reply was simple yet defiant. Come and take them. Selecting 300 warriors for the upcoming conflict wasn't just about picking the fiercest fighters. Leonidas chose men with living sons, ensuring the Spartan lineage would continue even if they perished. 4. The narrow pass Thermopylae's strategic advantage. Thermopylae, translating to hot gates because of the nearby sulfur springs, was a geographical marvel, flanked by mountains on one side and the sea on the other. It was a narrow pass that could be held by a small force against a much larger one. Leonidas, with his knowledge of the terrain, recognized this. He knew that in the open, the vast numbers of the Persians would overrun the Greeks. But at Thermopylae, their numbers would count for little. Narrowness of the pass meant the Persians could only send in a limited number of troops, at a time neutralizing their ninarcho advantage. 5. First would clashes and tactics. The first encounters were tentative. Persian archers sent volleys of arrows, attempting to weaken the Spartan lines. The Spartans, using their large shields, the Aspis, formed a wall, deflecting the arrows with ease. The term, come back with your shield or on. It was not just a saying, it was a way of life. When the Persian infantry charged, they were met with the Spartan phalanx, a formation where shields interlocked and spears protruded out, forming an impenetrable wall of men and metal. Wave after wave crashed against the Spartans. They stood firm, their discipline and training evident. 6. The Immortals' Defeat Persians alight, the Immortals, were the answer to the Spartans' resilience. Their reputation preceded them. Every man who fell in battle was quickly replaced, giving the impression that they were indeed immortal. Their precision, agility, and discipline were unmatched. Xerxes, frustrated by the resistance of the 300, dispatched this alight force to crush the Spartans. However, the narrow terrain of Thermopylae was the great equalizer. The Spartans, using their superior tactics and knowledge of the terrain, isolated pockets of immortals, using the phalanx formation to break them down. The day ended with heavy Persian casualties. The invincible immortals met their match, and the Spartans remained defiant. 7. Ephialtes and the Betrayal However, nature and bravery have one common enemy treachery. Ephialtes, a local Greek, bitter and seeking favor with the Persians. 
reveal the mountain path that would lead behind the Spartan lines. For Texas, this was the breakthrough he needed. As dawn broke, Leonidas was informed that the Persians were flanking them. Faced with a tactical nightmare, he huddled with the leaders of the other. Greek city-states fighting alongside him. Decision was clear. They would retreat, regroup, and face the Persians another day. But Leonidas and his 300 Spartans would stay back. They would be the rear guard, ensuring the safe retreat of the others. It was a suicide mission, but the Spartans didn't waver. Their ethos was clear fight to the end, never retreat. 8. Last stand the final dawn at Thermopylae. The final day of the Battle of Thermopylae was both tragic and epic. As the sun rose, the Spartans prepared themselves for what they knew was their final battle. They fought with unparalleled bravery, their every move, singing an ode to their training, discipline, and love for Sparta. Persian forces swarmed from all sides. Arrows darkened the skies. The Spartans, despite their bravery, were slowly pushed back, their numbers dwindling. King Lenidas, leading from the front, fell. In their grief and rage, the Spartans fought even more fiercely, protecting their fallen king's body. As the day wore on, the inevitable happened. The last of the Spartans were surrounded and overwhelmed. They didn't make it easy for the Persians. Every Spartan took down multiple Persians before they were defeated. Battleground was a testament to their bravery, littered with bodies from both sides. Ein, legacy more than just a battle. Battle of Thermopylae, at first glance, was a defeat for the Greeks. But in the grand tapestry of the Greco-Persian Wars, it was a strategic success, delay caused by the Spartans. Gave the other Greek city-states the time they needed to prepare. Combined Greek forces eventually repelled the Persians at the Battle of Plataea, ensuring Greece's freedom. Beyond the tactical aspects, Thermopylae stood as a beacon of courage, sacrifice, and the indomitable human spirit. Three hundred Spartans knew they were marching to their deaths, yet they did so willingly for the love of their homeland. Their story, passed down through generations, serves as a testament to the lengths humans can go to when they're driven by duty and honor. 10. Echoes Through Time The story of Thermopylae, of King Lenidas, and his 300 brave warriors, has resonated through the corridors of time. It has inspired countless tales of bravery, movies, books, and art. It's a reminder that sometimes victory doesn't mean surviving, it means standing up for what you believe in, even in the face of insurmountable odds. In our modern world, where conflicts are more ideological than physical, Thermopylae serves as a reminder. A reminder that sometimes, taking a stand, even when it's uncomfortable or dangerous, is the only way forward. Whether it's standing up to bullies, fighting against injustice, or challenging oppressive regimes, the Spartan spirit is something we can all learn from. In the end, Thermopylae isn't just a battle, it's an ethos, a way of life. A call to never give in, no matter the odds. Closing remarks, the timelessness of Thermopylae. It's often said that history is the greatest teacher presenting to us. Tales of triumphs, tragedies, courage, and betrayals. It lays before us a tableau of human spirit and endeavor. Among the myriad tales that dot the landscape of human civilization, Battle of Thermopylae stands out, not for its military strategy or grandeur, but for the sheer indomitable spirit it represents. In a world filled with advanced weaponry and technology, one might wonder what relevance a battle fought thousands of years ago holds today. The weapons of that age are obsolete. The strategies may be outdated, and the terrain itself has changed over time. Yet, the story of 300 Spartans standing firm against a vastly superior force is retold generation after generation. Why? In conclusion, while the weapons, tactics, and faces of war may change, the essence of the human spirit remains the same. Battle of Thermopylae, with its unmatched valor, and sacrifice stands as a testament to what we, as humans, are capable of when pushed against a wall. It reminds us that sometimes the most significant victories aren't about survival, but about making a point, about leaving, behind a legacy that will inspire generations to come. As we move forward, crafting our tales and legends, let's remember the Spartans and ensure that their sacrifice, spirit, and message never fade into oblivion. I hope this rendition of the Battle of Thermopylae provides inspiration and learning for all readers. The End Title, Roanoke, The Mystery of the Vanished Village Chapter 1, A New Beginning Promise of uncharted territories has always captivated the human spirit. The late 16th century was no different. The New World, a vast expanse of land waiting to be explored, was the latest attraction. 
Across the Atlantic lay a land filled with promise and potential, where England hoped to establish a permanent settlement. A beacon of English influence in a world dominated by the Spanish. Sir Walter Raleigh, a dashing English explorer with ambitions as grand as the oceans he sailed, had been granted the right by Queen Elizabeth I to claim and colonize any remote, heathen and barbarous lands, not already claimed by other Christian nations. This was a golden opportunity, and Raleigh, with fire in his eyes and hope in his heart, set his sights on the eastern coast of what we now know as the United States. Choosing a team of ambitious settlers, Raleigh prepared for the voyage to the New World. Among these brave souls was John White, an artist and friend of Raleigh's, who would play a pivotal role in the events to follow. After a few unsuccessful attempts, in 1587, Raleigh and his team decided on Roanoke Island, situated off the coast of present-day North Carolina, as their settlement site. The island seemed perfect isolated from potential threats, fertile for cultivation, and surrounded by deep waters, ideal for anchorage. Little did they know that this hopeful beginning would lead to one of history's most baffling mysteries. Chapter 2. The First Hurdles Life in the New World was far from the utopian dream the settlers had imagined, while the land was lush and the waters. Abundant, challenges lurked at every corner. They needed to build shelters, find food, and most crucially, establish relations with the native inhabitants. Roanoke Island was home to the Native American tribes of the Algonquian-speaking Carolina, Algonquian people. Initially, relations between the English settlers and the indigenous people were amicable. They traded goods, shared stories, and the settlers even recorded observing the natives' way of life. John White, with his artist's eye, made watercolor paintings of the indigenous people, the villages, and the local flora and fauna. These would later prove to be invaluable records of the native culture. However, as time passed, the delicate balance of trust began to shift. Some of the tribes, leaders grew wary of the settlers' intentions, and skirmishes broke out. Footstocks began to dwindle as the settlers, unfamiliar with the land, struggled to cultivate crops. To make matters worse, a harsh winter was approaching. Realizing they were ill-equipped, the settlers decided they needed more supplies from England. Their very survival depended on it. And so, a plan was hatched. John White, given his close ties with Raleigh, and his understanding of the colony's needs, would travel back to England, gather the necessary supplies, and return to Roanoke. As White prepared for his journey, the settlers, including his daughter Eleanor Dare, who had recently given birth to Virginia, to the first English child born in the Americas, watched with bated breath. White made a solemn promise. He would return with the supplies as swiftly as possible. Little did they know, this would be the last time. Many of them would set eyes on each other. Chapter 3 An Unexpected Delay Back in England, John White was met with a mix of astonishment and admiration. Stories of the New World, of encounters with natives, of the bounteous, yet alien land, and of the birth of Virginia Dare captured the imagination of many. But White had no time for storytelling. His primary concern was to gather supplies and return to Roanoke. However, England was in turmoil. The Spanish Armada was preparing to attack, and every available ship was conscripted for defense. I was pleased to prioritize a relief mission to Roanoke fell on deaf ears. Every passing day filled him with dread, images of starving settlers, including his own family, haunting his nights. Finally, in 1588, the English fleet defeated the Spanish Armada, a victory that filled the nation with pride and relief. But for White, the celebration was bittersweet. The immediate threat was over, but three long years had passed since he left Roanoke. Chapter 4 The Return to Silence with the immediate threat from Spain called, John White wasted no time. Securing a ship and the much needed supplies, he sailed back to the New World, his heart heavy with anticipation. But nothing could prepare him for what awaited. As Roanoke Island appeared on the horizon, White looked eagerly for signs of life, for the bustling colony he'd left behind. But as they anchored and rowed to shore, an eerie silence enveloped them. The colony was deserted. Houses were dismantled methodically, not destroyed in haste. There were no signs of a struggle or conflict. Most perplexing was the absence of bodies or graves, suggesting that the settlers hadn't faced a deadly attack. On one of the palisades, White found a single word carved, Croton. There were no distress symbols, which the settlers had previously agreed to display, if they faced any danger and had to evacuate. White was devastated, but also puzzled. Croton was the name of a nearby island, known today as Hatter's Island. 
and home to a friendly Native American tribe. Did the settlers move there? Were they forced to? With worsening weather and a dwindling crew, Ice's hope of solving the mystery was dashed as they were forced to return to England. The Roanoke colony and its settlers, including the first English child born in the New World, had vanished without a trace. Chapter 5 Crotoon's Tale Crotoon Island, now known as Hatteras Island, was inhabited by a tribe who had lived there for generations. Their lives revolved around the ebb and flow of the seasons, bounties of the sea, and the tales told around roaring fires. One evening, as the sun cast long shadows over the island, the tribe's eldest storyteller, Mahini, began to narrate a tale that no one had heard before. Children gathered around, their eyes wide with anticipation, while adults exchanged puzzled glances. Many seasons ago, Nahini began, strange men, women and children, pale as the sand, arrived in our land. They came on large floating islands with white wings. He described how the Roanoke settlers, facing food shortages, and an unforgiving land, had sought the help of the Crotones. Tribe had initially been wary, but had taken pity on the strangers, especially the children, and had welcomed them. They learned our ways, our songs, and our language. In return, they showed us objects of wonder, shiny metals, fabrics smoother than any we had felt, and tools that made work easier. But as the seasons change, so did the dynamics between the settlers and the natives. Some settlers longed for their old world, while others desired to merge their lives with the tribe. Tensions grew, with differences in customs and disputes over resources. Chapter 6 Love Beyond Boundaries In the midst of these trying times, a bond formed between Eleanor, a settler and daughter of John White, and Takoda, a young warrior of the Croton tribe. Their love was a secret whispered between the trees, hidden from the prying eyes of both their communities. One day, while the couple met in their secret spot, a grove sacred to the Crotones, they were discovered by members from both sides. Confrontation turned violent, with swords and arrows drawn. In the Chows, Takoda was gravely injured, protecting Eleanor. The incident became the catalyst for a decision. The majority of settlers, fearing retaliation and also feeling out of place, decided to leave Crotone. A few, including Eleanor, chose to stay, embracing their new life and family. Chapter 7 Merging of Two Worlds as the sun rose the next day, the settlers, who had chosen to stay, began to integrate more deeply with the Crotoon tribe. They participated in ceremonies, hunts, and the daily activities of the tribe. In return, they shared their knowledge of farming, construction, and other skills they had brought from England. Eleanor, nursing Takoda back to health, became a bridge between the two cultures. Their child, a symbol of their united worlds, was raised with stories from both heritages. However, the settlers who had left faced a grim fate, unprepared and lacking the necessary skills. To survive in the wild, many perished. The few who survived were believed to have been assimilated into other native tribes, or met other unforeseen ends. Chapter 8 The Return and Revelation Years later, when John White and his crew landed on Roanoke, they found no trace of the settlers because there was none to be found there. The word Croton was a message not of distress, but of direction. It was meant to guide any searcher to the tribe and their integrated family. Unfortunately, adverse weather conditions and a myriad of other challenges prevented White from exploring further and uncovering the truth behind the mystery. A settler's story with the Crotoons remained untold for years, becoming stuff of legends and whispers until one fateful day when an old diary, believed to be Eleanor's, was discovered. It detailed her life, her love for Takoda, and the decisions the settlers made. Conclusion Lessons from Roanoke the tale of Roanoke serves as a poignant reminder of the complexities of human nature, challenges of coexistence, and the boundless potential of love to bridge divides. In a world where differences often pull us apart, stories like these beckon us to find common ground, to understand, and to build together. The End Title, Nicola and the Spark of Dreams Chapter 1 A Curious Boy in Croatia In the small, picturesque town of Smuljan, Croatia, the air was charged with anticipation, the town, nestled among lush hills and cascading waterfalls, was about to welcome a new life. As a lightning storm raged outside, a baby named Nikola Tesla came into the world. Townspeople often joked that the lightning had chosen this very moment for a reason. For young Nikola, born amidst such a storm, seemed destined to dance with electricity. Growing up, the curious boy was constantly lost in thought, his imagination, always alight with new ideas. 
His favorite pastime was to wander to the edges of Smuljan, staring for hours at the mesmerizing waterfalls. With the rush of water pounding in his ears, he would often dream, what if we could capture all this energy? To others, it was just the fanciful dreams of a boy. But for Nicola, it was the start of a lifelong passion. His childhood was filled with experiments and invention. Using simple tools and the vast knowledge he acquired from devouring books, he made small machines, much to the amazement of his peers. He often spoke about a future where energy was abundant and free for all, while the children admired his creations. They also knew that Smuljan was just a stepping stone for Nicola's ambitions. Chapter 2 The Move to the City of Lights Years went by, and the boy. From Smuljan turned into a young man, with a fierce determination in his eyes. The whispers of his ambitions took him, far from home to the heart of innovation and dreams New York City. The city, with its towering skyscrapers, seemed to touch the sky. It was bustling with thinkers, inventors, and dreamers from every corner of the world. The city's energy was palpable, and Nicola felt he had come to the right place. In the labyrinth of New York, Nicola sought opportunities. He arrived with a few belongings, but a wealth of knowledge. He had heard of the great inventor, Thomas Edison, and his groundbreaking work with electricity. With hope in his heart and ideas racing in his mind, Nicola approached Edison's office. The first meeting was nothing short of electric. Edison, intrigued by this European inventor, gave Nicola a series of challenging tasks. Nicola not only completed them but also improved on Edison's designs. However, while the two shared a passion for invention, their views on electricity began to diverge. Chapter 3 Edison does Tesla the electric duel. Edison, already a renowned figure, believed in direct current D. His vision was a world powered by D systems. But Nicola, ever the innovator, saw the limitations of D. In his mind, alternating current AC was the future. It could travel vast distances without significant power loss, unlike D. The stage was set for one of history's most famous technological battles, the War of the Currents. As the two giants of the electrical world, locked horns, New York City became their battleground. Edison, with his resources and influence, launched a campaign against Agger, branding it as dangerous. But Tesla, undeterred, began demonstrating the safety and efficiency of A. With each public demonstration, where he illuminated entire streets and buildings with A, Tesla garnered more support. The climax of their duel came with the proposal to illuminate the Chicago World's Fair. While Edison's bed was steep, Tesla, backed by George Westinghouse, proposed a significantly lower cost using A. Their proposal won, and the success of the fair's illumination solidified at his place as the electrical system of the future. Chapter 4 The Magic of Alternating Current With the world slowly aligning with Tesla's vision, he intensified his work on A. He demonstrated its versatility by designing the first hydroelectric power plant at Niagara Falls. The world watched in awe as the mighty falls not only showcased nature's majesty, but also illuminated homes miles away. This was Tesla's dream from his smuldering days coming to life, harnessing nature's energy. His inventions didn't stop there. From the Tesla coil to the induction motor, his contributions to electrical engineering were groundbreaking. Each invention brought humanity closer to a new age of electrical wonder. Chapter 5 The Invisible Waves and Tesla's New Dream Nikola's mind was an ever churning engine of ideas. Having made significant strides in the world of electricity, he ventured into a realm that was considered almost mystical at the time wireless communication. While most of the world was captivated by wires and cables, Tesla saw a future where information flowed through the very air we breathe. In his Manhattan laboratory, amidst sparks and humming machinery, he worked on a transmitter that could send signals wirelessly. He believed that not only could messages be sent without wires, but energy could be as well. This idea, as futuristic as it sounded, was grounded in his experiments with resonant frequencies and the Earth's own electromagnetic field. News of his experiments caught the attention of the world. Morgan backed Tesla's ambitious project, the Warden Cliff Tower. Located on Long Island, this was to be Tesla's magnum opus, a transmission tower that would facilitate global communication and even provide free energy. Imagine a world where you could talk to someone across oceans without phones or wires. That was the dream Tesla was selling, and many bought into it. However, as construction began, and the tower started taking shape, challenges arose. The sheer scale of the project, combined with Tesla's habit of continuous iterations, meant escalating costs. 
Doubts began to creep in among his investors. The world was changing rapidly. Guillermo Marconi, using a few of Tesla's patents, had already sent a wireless message across the Atlantic. Though Marconi's technology was rudimentary compared to what Tesla envisioned, it was functional and cheaper. G. P. Morgan, seeing the potential in Marconi's work, and the mounting costs of Tesla's dream, pulled out of the project. Without funding, the Wardenclyffe dream crumbled. The tower, once a symbol of boundless potential, stood incomplete and was eventually demolished. Chapter 6 The Later Years and Legacy The setback with Wardenclyffe was profound. Tesla, the genius who had illuminated the world, found himself increasingly isolated. His ideas, which were once celebrated, now seemed far-fetched to many. Proposals like creating a shield around the Earth, using charged particles or harnessing the power of the cosmos were met with skepticism. But even in these challenging times, Tesla's mind never ceased to innovate. He contemplated ideas about renewable energy, pondered the possibilities of interplanetary communication, and even hinted at a weapon that could end wars a death ray. However, as years passed, brilliant inventor found himself overshadowed by commercial giants. While his contributions were unparalleled, his lack of business acumen and reluctance to patent, many of his inventions meant that others profited from his genius. Nikola Tesla passed away in 1943, alone in his New York hotel room. It was a quiet end to a life that had been anything but. The world mourned the loss of one of its brightest minds. In the years that followed, Tesla's legacy saw a resurgence. Very ideas that were once deemed eccentric became foundational in various fields. His vision of wireless communication is the bedrock of today's interconnected world. From the smartphones we can't live without to the satellites orbiting our planet. Traces of Tesla's genius can be found everywhere. Chapter 7 A Beacon for Future Generation The world has seen countless inventors, but few have dreamed as big as Nikola Tesla. His life is a testament to the power of perseverance, vision, and unyielding curiosity. While he faced numerous setbacks, his contributions have shaped the modern world in ways he could never have imagined. Today, schools and institutions bear his name, ensuring that future generations understand and appreciate his work. Annual science events celebrate Tesla Day, encouraging young minds to push the boundaries of what's possible. But perhaps the most significant testament to his impact is the way we remember him, not as a businessman or a mongol, but as a dreamer who saw the future. In his world, energy was abundant, communication was boundless, and the cosmos was within our reach. For anyone who has ever dared to dream, Tesla's life serves as both an inspiration and a cautionary tale. While his visions were grand, his challenges were equally formidable. But through it all, his belief in a brighter, interconnected future remained unshaken. In an age where innovation is often driven by profit, Tesla's story reminds us of a time when invention was about pushing humanity forward, about making the impossible possible. And as we stand on the cusp of new frontiers, with the cosmos within our grasp and technology intertwining with our daily lives, we can't help but wonder what would Tesla think of the world today? One thing is certain he would urge us to keep dreaming, keep inventing, and most importantly, keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. The end. Title Moses and the Miraculous Journey The Tale of Ten Promises Chapter 1 The Land of Pyramids and Pharaohs In a time long ago, Egypt was the center of the world, a place of grandeur and magnificence. The Nile River snaked its way across the land, making the soil fertile and giving life to all. Here, the powerful pharaohs ruled, their majesty, displayed in the vast pyramids they constructed. Yet, amidst these colossal structures and beneath the shadow of the Sphinx, a different story unfolded. The Hebrews, a resilient and spiritual group, were bound in chains, forced to work day in and day out. Their sweat and tears mixed with the mud bricks they fashioned. They longed for freedom, often singing songs of their ancestral homeland, a place flowing with milk and honey. Their plight was heartbreaking, a stark contrast to the splendors. The labor produce. Chapter 2 Moses the Prince Who Was Different Within the heart of the Pharaoh's palace, where golden walls glistened and exotic gardens bloomed, Moses, an adopted prince, led a life of luxury. He was educated by the finest tutors and took part in royal ceremonies. Yet, he often gazed upon the Hebrew slaves from his balcony, feeling an inexplicable connection. One fateful day, witnessing an Egyptian taskmaster's cruelty, he defended a Hebrew slave. This act changed his life. Fearing the Pharaoh's wrath, Moses fled into the desert. 
Here, he became a humble shepherd, a far cry from his princely life. The desert was also where his destiny awaited. Living among the Midianites, he learned of humility, love, and patience. He married and started a family. Yet, deep inside, a fire for justice and freedom still burned. He wasn't aware that soon, this inner fire would manifest in the form of a burning bush, setting him on a path that would change the course of history. As he transitioned into the next chapters, we'll see how a single individual, driven by purpose and guided by a higher power, can challenge empires and bring hope to the oppressed. Moses' tale teaches us that no matter where we come from or the adversities we face, we all possess the potential for greatness when guided by love, justice, and faith. Chapter 3, The Call from the Burning Bush The sun was blazing in the sunny desert, and the air shimmered with heat. Moses, now a seasoned shepherd, led his flock in search of pasture. Amidst the golden dunes, he stumbled upon a peculiar sight. A bush, consumed by flames, yet not burning up. Intrigued, he drew closer. From within the fire, a voice resonated, Moses, Moses, startled. He responded, Here I am. Voice, both authoritative and compassionate, identified itself as the God of his ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses was demanded to remove his sandals, for he stood on holy ground. God relayed the pain and cries of the Hebrews in Egypt. Moses was chosen to lead them out of bondage and into the promised land. The task seemed insurmountable. How could he, a mere shepherd, confront Pharaoh and free an entire people? But God assured him, I will be with you. Chapter 4 Plagues and the Hardened Heart Moses, with his brother Aaron, stood before Pharaoh, demanding, Let my people go. Pharaoh's pride and arrogance were unmoved. To convince him, God sent plague upon Egypt. Water turned to blood, frogs covered the land, and darkness enveloped the realm. Yet, with each calamity, Pharaoh's heart hardened. A final, most heart-wrenching plague was the death of every firstborn Egyptian. Moses instructed the Hebrews to mark their doorposts with lamb's blood as protection. That night, cries of anguish echoed throughout Egypt. Pharaoh, devastated and defeated, finally relented. Chapter 5 The Great Escape With Pharaoh's reluctant blessing, the Hebrews hastily packed their belongings, not even allowing their bread to rise, resulting in what we know today as matzah. They began their arduous journey, guided by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. But as they neared the Red Sea, they heard the thundering of hooves and saw a cloud of dust on the horizon. Pharaoh had changed his mind and sent his army to recapture them. Panic swept through the Hebrews. Were they to perish after getting so close to freedom? Moses, with unyielding faith, raised his staff. Before their was struck eyes, the waters of the Red Sea parted, creating a pathway. The Hebrews crossed safely, but as Pharaoh's army pursued, the waters roared back, swallowing the oppressors. Chapter 6 The Mountain's Revelation Journeying further, the Hebrews camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses was called to its peak, where for forty days and nights he communed with God. The Israelites, during his absence, grew restless and in their folly created a golden calf to worship. Their short-lived reverie was shattered upon Moses' descent bearing two stone tablets inscribed by the hand of God. These Ten Commandments became the moral compass for not just the Hebrews, but for countless generations across various civilizations. From honor your father and mother to you shall not steal, these principles encourage us to live harmoniously, promoting peace, trust, and kindness. By internalizing these lessons, we understand the value of perseverance, the importance of faith during trying times, and the universal ethics that guide humanity towards a harmonious coexistence. The tales of the Hebrews are not just historical accounts, but a testament to human spirit, resilience, and the quest for a higher purpose. Chapter 7 A Desert Discipline Jubilation of the Red Sea's parting was still fresh, but as days turned into weeks, the vast sunny desert became a crucible of faith. Food was scarce, and the blistering heat drained their spirits. The Hebrews lamented, were there, no grave in Egypt, that we must die in this wilderness? In their time of despair, God sent manna, a heavenly food, which appeared on the desert floor each morning. Despite its miraculous appearance, it came with its own lessons. Gather only what you need for a day, trust that more will come tomorrow. And no gathering on the Sabbath. Many tried hoarding, but found their stash rotting the very next day. It was a lesson in trust and contentment. Chapter 8 The Wellspring of Patience Water the elixir of the desert became another challenge. With their supplies dwindling, they confronted Moses, their patience running thin. 
Instead of reproaching them, Moses turned to God, seeking guidance. He was instructed to strike a certain rock. Skepticism turned to wonder as fresh water gushed out, quenching the thirst of hundreds of thousands. Yet, these miracles came with thundering messages. The water was not just a relief, but a lesson on patience and the belief that solutions often lie just beyond the horizon of despair. By constantly challenging Moses and then witnessing the solutions he brought forth, the Hebrews were learning the invaluable lesson of persistent faith. These desert tales remind us that adversities are but opportunities in disguise, pushing us to dig deeper, trust more, and forge a connection with the divine, ensuring our spiritual growth amidst worldly challenges. Chapter 9 The Mountain's Revelation As the Hebrew journeyed, a particular mountain loomed in the distance, wreathed in clouds and mystery Mount Sinai. This mountain was to be the theater of one of the most pivotal moments in their history. Moses was summoned to its peak, and the people were told to consecrate themselves for what was to come. For forty days and nights, Moses stayed on the mountain. While thunder roared and lightning crackled, the Hebrews at the base watched in awe and trepidation. The mountain itself seemed alive, resonating with the voice of the Almighty. When Moses finally descended, his face radiated, and there a glow, testament to his communion with the divine. He bore with him two tablets engraved by God's own hand. The Ten Commandments, a moral compass, were delivered. Chapter 10, a covenant sealed. However, while Moses was on the mountain, in his absence, many Hebrews, overcome by fear and uncertainty, reverted to their old ways. They constructed a golden calf, a remnant of the Egyptian gods, and began to worship it. Returning to this scene, Moses' heart sank. The freshly received commandments, one of which clearly stated not to worship idols, were already being broken. In his despair and anger, Moses smashed the tablets. It was a moment of reckoning. The Hebrews had to confront their weaknesses and inconsistencies. Moses interceded on their behalf, and after much pleading, God had agreed to renew his covenant. A repentant nation watched as Moses, once again, ascended the mountain and returned with a new set of tablets. This event serves as a powerful reminder of human frailty, but also of the possibilities of redemption. Even after witnessing miracles, people can falter, but with genuine remorse and guidance, they can rebuild their covenant with God. The tales of the Hebrews' journey and the Ten Commandments go beyond mere historical or religious significance. It underscore universal themes of faith, patience, and the constant human struggle between doubt and belief, despair and hope. They teach us that even in our weakest moments, there's always a path to redemption. The end, the revolutionary stick, when Paris ignited a new world. Chapter 1 The Kingdom Before the Fire In a time long before you and I were born, grand city of Paris sparkled like a jewel in the heart of Europe. With its towering cathedrals and winding river, Paris was a city of dreams. But like many dreams, it had its shadows too. Imagine grand palaces filled with glittering chandeliers, where men and women dressed in the finest silks and satins danced the night away. They laughed, they sang, they feasted on the most delicious foods. This was the life of the royalty and the rich, a life of grandeur and opulence. But outside these palaces, life was very different. The streets of Paris were home to the common people, the bakers, the shoemakers, the farmers, and many more. These folks wore simple clothes, worked hard every day, and often went to bed with empty stomachs. While the rich dined on banquets, many in Paris wondered where their next meal would come from. You see, in this kingdom, there was a huge gap between the rich and the poor. The royalty and the nobles live in luxury, while the common people struggled each day. And as the years went by, this gap only grew wider. Chapter 2 Whispers of Change It all started as quiet conversation. In the bustling markets where merchants sold their wares, in the cozy, corners of candlelit taverns, and even in the shadows of grand cathedrals, people began to talk. Why do we suffer while the nobles feast? asked one. Why can't we have a say in how things are run? wondered another. These weren't just idle chats. These were the early sounds of people wanting change. They believed in a new France, where everyone, be they rich or poor, noble or common, had a voice. They dreamed of fairness, of justice, and of a life free from hunger and hardship. Among these voices were thinkers and writers, who spoke of liberty, equality, and brotherhood. They wrote books and pamphlets, sharing their ideas of a world where power wasn't just for the kings and queens, but for everyone. The ideas spread like wildfire, and soon, what started as whispers became loud discussions. Chapter 3 The Revolutionary Stick Makes Its Mark Now you might wonder, 
What's a revolutionary stick? It wasn't just any old stick. It was a symbol, a sign of change. You see, during this time, symbols were powerful. They brought people together, united in a common cause, and in a world without tea or internet symbols, were a way to spread a message far and wide. The revolutionary stick was one such symbol. It was said that when someone was ready to stand up for the new France, they'd draw a line on the ground using this stick. This line was a promise, a commitment to fight for a better future. Soon, all across Paris and beyond, lines were being drawn. It was no longer about just the nobles and the commoners. It was about the old ways versus the new, the past versus the future. The revolutionary stick had set the stage for a massive change, and France would never be the same again. Chapter 4 The Bastille and the Bells of Freedom Remember those grand buildings where the nobles danced and laughed? Well, there was another imposing structure in Paris. This one wasn't filled with laughter. It was the Bastille, a mighty fortress that loomed over the city, casting a long, dark shadow. Bastille wasn't just a castle, it was a prison where many unfortunate souls were locked away, some for reasons they didn't even know. One summer day, as the sun blazed down on Paris, a massive crowd gathered outside the Bastille. They weren't there to admire its tall towers or thick walls. No, they were there with a purpose. They were there to take it down. Why the Bastille, you ask? Because for many, it was a symbol of everything that was wrong. It's tall, dark so it represented the king's power, the nobles' control, and the many secrets that were hidden away from the people. The crowd outside shouted and sang, their voices echoing off the stone walls. They demanded the release of prisoners, they called for justice, and they clamored for change. And then, with a force that surprised even themselves, they stormed the mighty fortress. Stone by stone, brick by brick, the Bastille was taken apart. The fall of the Bastille was more than just a demolition of stone and mortar. It was a message, a clear sign to the rulers that the people of France were ready for change, and they wouldn't be stopped. Chapter 5 A Nation's Heartbeat, The Assembly With the fall of the Bastille, the winds of change swept through France. The whispers of the past became the rolling cries of the present. The revolutionary stick, which was once a mere symbol, was now a real force, pushing the nation forward. People of France, united in their quest for a better future, formed the National Assembly. Think of this assembly as a giant gathering, where representatives from all over France came together. They weren't kings or nobles, they were everyday folks, just like the bakers and farmers of Paris. And they had a dream, a dream of a France where all men were equal, where voices from every corner of the land were heard. Together, they began crafting the Constitution, a set of rules that would shape the new France. It spoke of liberty, of rights, and of the freedom to live without fear, and at its heart lay the core principles that the revolution had been. Born from liberty, equality, fraternity. Chapter 6 The Reign of Fire and the Rise of Hope But change, especially one so vast, is never easy, as the National Assembly tried to reshape the country. There were many who resisted. The next few years saw France caught in a whirlwind. There were celebrations, yes, but also struggles. There were moments of unity, but also deep divisions. A city that once danced to the tunes of royal banquets, now echoed with the cries of revolution. The streets, which once buzzed with daily life, became stages for rallies, protests, and, unfortunately, even violence. King Louis XVI, the then ruler of France, found himself in a toast spot, and amidst the chows, he was imprisoned and eventually met a fate. None had imagined the guillotine. The same went for many nobles, their end, marked by the sharp blade of revolution. Yet, even in these dark times, the flame of hope never flickered out. People of France, even as they grappled with the challenges of their new reality, never lost sight of their dream. A dream of a nation united, of a land where every voice counted, and of a future where every child be it in Paris, or the farthest village could live a life of dignity and freedom. Such were the tumultuous times of the French, revolution a period when Paris truly set the world on fire, not with flames, but with ideas. It is that spoke of freedom, of equality, and of a world where power rested, not with kings or queens, but with the people. Chapter 7, A Whisper Called Robespierre In our story, amidst the heroes and the ideals, there also lurked shadows. One such shadow was a man named Maximilien Robespierre. Remember him? He was a slender, well-spoken man, who rose to power during the most intense days of the revolution. Now Robespierre wasn't always seen as a shadow. In the beginning, Many saw him as a beacon of hope, 
He passionately spoke about liberty and believed in the revolution's ideals. But as time went on, his methods became, let's say, questionable. You see, Robespierre started to believe that, for the revolution to truly succeed, its enemies needed to be removed. And so, the reign of terror began. Anyone who was even suspected of being against the revolution was arrested, and many faced the guillotine. The very revolution that had started as a cry for freedom now seemed to be taking away that very freedom from its people. Chapter 8 The Turning Tides As days turned into months, many in France began to realize that the revolution, under leaders like Robespierre, had taken a dark turn. The same squares where children once played now witnessed the relentless fall of the guillotine's blade. But remember, the spirit of the French people wasn't one to be suppressed just as they had risen against the oppression of the king and the nobles. They now rose against the tyranny of their own leaders. Robespierre's reign came to an end, and with it, the most violent days of the revolution. The French people, having learned from their mistakes, began rebuilding their nation with renewed hope and wisdom. Chapter 9 The Dawn of a New Era with the shadows of the past behind them, France embarked on a new journey. They formed a government where the power was shared, ensuring that no single person could ever again wield unchecked authority. The revolution had changed France forever. The palaces and grandeur remained, but now every brick, every stone, and every corner of France echoed with the voices of its people. The spirit of liberty, equality, and fraternity was now deeply ingrained in the heart of the nation. People sang songs of the revolution, of the heroes, and even the villains, for they all played a part in shaping the history of France. Children in the streets of Paris played games, reenacting the storming of the Bastille, and families gathered around fires to share stories of those tumultuous times. Yes, the revolution had its dark days, but it also brought with it lessons that would guide not just France, but nations and people across the world. The idea that power belongs to the people, that freedom is a birthright, and that every voice, no matter how small, deserves to be heard. Through the smoke and flames, through the cries of despair and songs of hope, the French Revolution remains a testament to the indomitable spirit of the people and their undying quest for a better tomorrow. The End Title Mysteries of the Desert Deciphering the Ancient Nazca Lines in Peru Province won the tale of resilience in the face of adversity. In the heart of a lush province, nestled between towering mountains, there lived a community of farmers who had tilled the land for generations. Life was simple, and the people were content, for they knew the rhythm of the seasons and the art of nurturing the earth. But one year, disaster struck. A relentless drought descended upon the province, turning fertile fields into parched wastelands. The farmers watched in despair as their crops withered and their dreams turned to dust. In their darkest hour, the community came together. They shared what little they had. Each person contributed their unique skills. Some dug wells in search of water, while others devised ways to make the most of what remained. Their unity and determination were their greatest assets. Months passed, and the drought showed no mercy. The people persevered, finding solace in their collective spirit. They learned to adapt, discovering new ways to grow, to resistant crops and conserve precious water. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the drought ended. The province burst into life once more, and the fields flourish. The people had learned an invaluable lesson in the face of adversity. Unity, resilience, and the willingness to adapt were their most potent tools. Province too, the gift of compassion and generosity. In a bustling province, there lived a prosperous merchant named Rand. He was known far and wide for his wealth and success. Yet, despite his affluence, he was not content. Something was missing from his, my fierce sense of purpose beyond accumulating riches. One day, while traveling through a rural village, Red witnessed a sight that would change his life. He saw a group of children sharing a meager meal, laughing and playing despite their modest circumstances. Their faces radiated joy, and Raj was deeply moved. He approached the children and learned that they were orphans, cared for by a kind-hearted woman named Mira. She had little, but her love and compassion knew no bounds. She welcomed Raj into her modest home and shared her meager meal with him. In that moment, Raj realized the true wealth of the heart. He offered to support Mira's mission, providing resources to ensure the children had food, education, and a safe place to live. His life took on new meaning as he witnessed the transformation in these young lives. Rad's generosity inspired others in the province to join him in supporting Mira's cause. Together, they built a stool, a playground, and a shelter for the orphans. Rad had discovered that true wealth lay not in amassing riches for oneself, 
but in sharing one's blessings with those in need. Province 3 The Triumph of Perseverance In a province where the rugged terrain tested the limits of human endurance, there lived a determined young woman named May. She had a dream of becoming a skilled blacksmith, a craft traditionally dominated by men in her community. May's journey was far from easy. She faced skepticism, ridicule, and even opposition from some who believed that. A woman had no place at the forge, but Maya's spirit was unbreakable. She found an elderly blacksmith willing to teach her the trade, and she poured her heart and soul into every lesson. For years, Maya toiled tirelessly, perfecting her skills. She faced countless setbacks, often having to redo her work from scratch, but she never gave up. Her determination was her greatest strength. As the years passed, Maya's craftsmanship surpassed even the most skilled blacksmiths in the province. Her creations were works of art, renowned for their beauty and durability. Slowly but steadily, the community began to recognize her talent and dedication. Maya's story serves as a testament to the power of perseverance. In a world filled with obstacles, she showed that with unwavering determination and a passion. For one's craft, one can overcome any challenge and achieve greatness. Province for the wisdom of cooperation. In a bustling coastal province there, thrived a fishing community that had sustained itself for generations by working together. Their level who depended on the bounties of the sea, and they understood the importance of cooperation. One year, a massive storm ravaged the coast, destroying boats and fishing equipment. The fishermen faced a daunting challenge due to rebuild their livelihoods. From the ground up, they knew that unity was their greatest asset. Community came together, each family contributing what they could. Some provided wood for new boats, others repaired fishing nets, and the skilled craftsmen built sturdy vessels. Everyone had a role to play. Through their collective efforts, the fishermen not only recovered but thrived. The rebuilt boats were more resilient, their nets more efficient, and their sense of camaraderie stronger than ever. The storm had taught them a valuable lesson in times of adversity. Cooperation and mutual support were their most potent tools. This spirit of unity continued to define their way of life, ensuring that the community prospered for generations to come. Province 5 The Harmony of Diversity In a province known for its rich cultural tapestry, there lived people from diverse backgrounds, each with their unique customs and tradition. While this diversity enriched their lives, it also presented challenges in understanding and coexisting peacefully. One day, a young girl named Aisha had an idea. She decided to organize a festival that celebrated the customs and traditions of each community. She believed that by learning about each other's cultures, people could foster a deeper sense of unity. The festival was a resounding success. People from all walks of life came together to share their stories, music, dances, and food. They discovered the beauty in their differences and the common threads that bound them. Aisha's initiative not only created a greater sense of understanding, but also strengthened the bonds of friendship among the province's residents. The festival became an annual tradition, a testament to the power of celebrating diversity and fostering harmony. Province 6 The Healing Power of Forgiveness In a quiet province nestled amidst rowing hills, there lived two families, the Patels and the Maliks. For generations, a bitter feud had divided these families, rooted in a long forgotten dispute over land. Years turned into decades, and the animosity between the Patels and the Maliks only deepened. It seemed as though peace would forever elude them, and the wounds of the past festered. Then, one fateful day, a wise elder from the Patel family, named Amrita, had a revelation. She realized that the hatred and anger that had consumed her family for so long had brought nothing but pain and suffering. Amrita decided to extend an olive branch to the Maliks. She visited their home, not as a rival, but as a friend, and offered a sincere apology for the past. Maliks, too tired of the feud, accepted her gesture with open hearts. Slowly, the two families began to heal. They worked together, shared meals, and forged new bonds. Province watched in amazement as the Patels and the Maliks, once bitter enemies, became the closest of friends. Amrita's act of forgiveness had broken the cycle of hatred demonstrating the incredible healing power of forgiveness and reconciliation. Province learned that sometimes the most profound strength lay in letting go of grudges and embracing the potential for a brighter, more harmonious future. Province 7 The Wisdom of Simplicity In a province surrounded by towering mountains, there lived a hermit named Kev. He had chosen a life of simplicity. Residing in a small hut deep within the woods, Kevi possessed a deep understanding of the natural world and the art of contentment. 
One day, a scholar from the bustling city came seeking wisdom. He asked Kevi, What is the secret to a fulfilled life? Kevi smiled and pointed to the forest around them. Observe the trees, he said. They ask for nothing, yet they thrive. They sway with the winds of change and find joy in the sunlight, filtering through their leaves. The scholar was perplexed, but how can I find contentment in a world filled with desires and ambitions? Kevi replied, Desires are like passing clouds. They come and go, but your inner peace remains. Find joy in the simplest of moments, for true contentment lies in appreciating what you have. The scholar left Kevi's humble abode with a newfound perspective. He realized that the pursuit of material wealth and status had left him empty, while the hermit's wisdom had shown him the path to a rich and fulfilling life. From that day forward, he sought contentment not in extravagance, but in the beauty of simplicity. The end. Little, a small step the day mankind landed on the moon. Chapter 1 The Dream of Reaching the Moon Once upon a time, not too long ago, there was a dream a dream to go to the moon. It was a dream that captured the imagination of people all around the world. But it was more than just a dream, it was a challenge. A bold mission that would push the boundaries of human exploration. The dream of reaching the moon began with the dawn of the space age. In the 1950s, after the end of World War I, the United States and the Soviet Union found themselves in a new kind of competition a race to conquer the final frontier of space. The Soviet Union took an early lead by launching the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, into space in 1957. This tiny metal sphere, peeping as it orbited the Earth, marked the beginning of the space race. In the United States, President John Kennedy believed that it was time for his country to take the lead in space exploration. He challenged America to set a seemingly impossible goal to land a man on the moon and bring him safely back to Earth before the end of the 1960s. It was a dream that would require determination, innovation, and the combined efforts of thousands of people. The dream of reaching the moon was not just about scientific discovery. It was also about proving what humans could achieve when they set their minds to it. It was a dream that fired the imagination of young and old alike, and it would become one of the defining moments of the 20th century. Chapter 2. The Space Race As the dream of reaching the moon took hold, it sparked a fierce competition between two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. This competition became known as the Space Race, and it was about more than just landing on the moon. It was a race for prestige, power, and technological superiority. The Soviet Union had already made a significant leap in the space race by launching Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, this achievement sent shockwaves through the United States and the rest of the world. Suddenly, space was no longer the stuff of science fiction. It was a new frontier to be explored. In response to the Soviet Union's success, the United States redoubled its efforts. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, was established in 1958, and the Mercury and Gemini programs paved the way for the ultimate goal, the Apollo program, which aimed to put astronauts on the moon. The space race was not just about sending astronauts into space, it was also about sending a message to the world. It was a demonstration of technological prowess, a way to showcase the capabilities of each superpower. The world watched as rockets were launched, astronauts were trained, and milestones were reached. But amidst the rivalry, there was also a spirit of cooperation. Despite their differences, the United States and the Soviet Union shared a common goal, the exploration of space, they exchanged information and even conducted joint missions in space. As the 1960s progressed, the space race reached its climax with the moon. As the ultimate prize, the dream of reaching the moon was within reach, and both nations were determined to make it a reality. After three, the rocket that could. The dream of reaching the moon required a special kind of rocket, one that could carry astronauts across the vast expanse of space and safely land them on the lunar surface. That rocket was the Apollo. The Apollo program was a colossal undertaking, and at its heart was the Saturn V rocket, a technological marvel of its time. Standing over 360 feet tall, it was taller than the Statue of Liberty, and more powerful than anything ever built. The Saturn V had three parts, each with its own crucial role to play. Bottom part was the first stage, powered by five massive engines that burned kerosene and liquid oxygen. It provided the initial thrust needed to escape Earth's gravity. The second stage, perched atop the first, was powered by five engines that burned liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. It pushed the spacecraft even higher and faster, propelling it toward the moon. The third stage, the command module, 
was where the astronauts lived and worked during the journey. It was their home away from home, equipped with the controls, instruments, and supplies needed for the mission. The most important part of the rocket was the lunar module, affectionately known as the LEM Lunar Excursion Module or EAGLE. It was designed to carry astronauts from lunar orbit to the moon surface and back again. It had four legs for a soft landing, and its spindly appearance earned it the nickname Spider. The Saturn there was a testament to human ingenuity and engineering prowess. It had to perform flawlessly, carrying astronauts on a journey through the harsh vacuum of space to a destination over 240,000 miles away. It was a rocket that could, and it would carry the dream of reaching the moon to its ultimate destination. Chapter 4 Blast Off On July 16, 1969, a sunny morning at Cape Candy, Florida, a momentous event was about to take place. A massive crowd had gathered to witness history in the making the launch of Apollo 11, the mission that would take astronauts to the moon. As the clock counted down, the anticipation grew. Beside the command module, three astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mitchell Collins prepared for their incredible journey. They were about to ride atop the mighty Saturn rocket, a vehicle so powerful that it would propel them out of Earth's atmosphere and into the vastness of space. At 932 oh, me the engines of the Saturn were roared to life, filling the air with thunderous noise and billowing clouds of smoke. Slowly, majestically, the rocket began to rise from the launch pad. It was a sight to behold, a testament to human achievement. The Saturn reclimbed higher and higher, its powerful engines, pushing it toward the heavens. Inside the command module, the astronauts felt the tremendous forces of liftoff, that they were trained for this moment and their hearts were filled with excitement and determination. As a rocket disappeared into the blue sky, the world watched in awe. Dream of reaching the moon was now a reality, and the adventure had only just begun. The astronauts were on their way, hurtling through the void of space toward the distant lunar surface. Chapter 5 The Lung Trip With the Earth shrinking behind them, the Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mitchell Cohen settled into the next phase of their journey, the long trip to the moon. Inside the command module named Columbia, they had everything they needed to survive in the harsh environment of space. The trip to the moon was not a straight line. It followed a carefully calculated path, like a cosmic highway through the solar system. The astronauts had to rely on their navigation instruments and the precise calculations of NASA's mission control to ensure they stayed on course. Life inside the command module was a bit like camping in a small, high-touch tin can. The astronauts had sleeping bags, freeze-dried food, and even a small window to peer out into the endless expanse of space. There was no gravity in space, which meant everything floated food, tools, and even the astronauts themselves. They had to learn to move around in a weightless environment, using hand drills and Velcro to stay anchored. During the journey, the astronauts conducted experiments, took photographs of the Earth and the Moon, and communicated with mission control back on Earth. They also had time for some leisure activities, like reading and listening to music. They even had a tape recorder with some of their favorite songs. But as they ventured farther from Earth, the view outside their tiny window changed. Blue and white orb of Earth grew smaller, and the moon, the destination, slowly came into view. It was a breathtaking sight, a reminder of the incredible journey they were undertaking. After Six Eagle has landed, after three days of traveling through space, Apollo 11 approached the moon. The tension on board was palpable as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin prepared to climb into the lunar module, Eagle. Mitchell Collins remained in the command module, orbiting the moon. On July 20, 1969, as the world held its breath, the lunar module separated from the command module. The two spacecraft moved apart, and for a while, Armstrong and Aldrin were on their own, hurtling toward the lunar surface. Inside the lunar module, Armstrong and Aldrin kept a close eye on their instruments as they descended toward the moon. They had to make sure that Eagle was on course and that they would touch down in a safe spot. But as they got closer to the surface, they encountered a problem a few of the boulders and a large crater in their planned landing area. With just seconds of fuel remaining, Armstrong took control of the spacecraft and guided it to a smoother spot. It was a tense moment, but his skill and calm under pressure paid off. At 417 and Eastern Daylight Time on July 20, 1969, Eagle touched down gently on the moon's surface. Armstrong's voice crackled over the radio, Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It was a historic moment. 
one that marked the first time humans had ever landed on another celestial body. Dream of reaching the moon had become a reality. Chapter 7, That's One Small Step. Beside the lunar module, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had a checklist of tasks to complete before they could venture out onto the moon's surface. They had to prepare their spacesuits, to pressurize the cabin, and make sure everything was in working order. Finally, it was time to open the hatch and take that historic step onto the moon. Neil Armstrong, as the mission commander, was the first to descend the ladder. As he stepped onto the lunar surface, he uttered those famous words, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Buzz Aldrin followed him, and together, they became the first humans to walk on the moon. He described the surface as powdery and gray, with craters and rocks scattered about. It was like a desolate, alien landscape. The two astronauts planted the American flag, conducted experiments, and collected samples of moon rocks and soil. They also set up scientific instruments to transmit data back to Earth. All the while, they were in constant communication with mission control. Millions of miles away, their time on the moon was limited by their oxygen supply and the need to get back to the lunar module safely. After about two and a half hours, they climbed back into Eagle, bringing a piece of the moon with them the dreams and aspirations of all humanity. Chapter 8 Moonwalk Magic While Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were exploring the moon's surface, Mitchell Collins orbited above in the command module, Columbia. He had the unique perspective of watching the moon from afar, waiting for his fellow astronauts to return. For Armstrong and Aldrin, the experience of walking on the moon was a mixture of excitement, awe, and scientific discovery. They marveled at the stark beauty of the lunar landscape and the vastness of space all around them. They experimented with the moon's reduced gravity, bouncing and leaping across the surface like no one had ever done before. They left footprints that would remain undisturbed for thousands of years, a testament to their historic journey. They also had important work to do. They set up a seismometer to measure moonquakes and collected rock and soil samples to bring back to Earth. These samples would provide valuable insights into the moon's geology and history. Their time on the moon was limited, and after about 21 hours, it was time to return to the lunar module. With their backpacks loaded with precious moon rocks, they climbed back up the ladder and into Eagle. Chapter 9 Home Sweet Home With their mission on the moon Accomplished, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin rejoined Mitchell Cohen's in the command module, Columbia. The lunar module, Eagle, had served its purpose and was left behind on the moon's surface. Journey back to Earth was just as critical as the journey to the moon. The astronauts had to run Desus with Columbia in lunar orbit, delicate maneuver that required precise calculations and timing. Once reunited, the three astronauts prepared for the long journey home. They had to fire the spacecraft's engines at just the right moment to break free from the moon's gravity and set a course for Earth. As they left the moon behind, the astronauts reflected on their historic mission. They had achieved the dream of reaching the moon and had left their mark on its surface. Now they looked forward to returning home, where they would be greeted as heroes. The journey through the void of space took several days, during which they conducted experiments, took measurements, and communicated with mission control. It was a time of reflection and anticipation as they neared Earth. Chapter 10 A Hero's Welcome On July 24, 1969, after a journey of over 240,000 miles, Apollo 11 reentered Earth's atmosphere. Command module, Columbia, streaked across the sky like a blazing star, protected by a heat shield, designed to withstand the intense heat of reentry. Beside Columbia, the astronauts felt the intense pressure. As they hurtled toward the ocean, it was a tense moment, but the spacecraft performed flawlessly, parachutes deployed, and Columbia splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mitchell Collins were recovered by a waiting helicopter and brought aboard the US Hornet aircraft carrier. They were greeted as heroes, not just by the United States, but by people all around the world. Their historic journey had captured the imagination of humanity, and their achievement was celebrated as a testament to what could be accomplished through determination, innovation, and the dream of reaching the moon. Dream had become a reality and it was a small step for man, but a giant leap for mankind. The legacy of Apollo 11 would live on, inspiring future generations to reach for the stars and continue the exploration of space. Postscript the legacy of Apollo 11. The dream of reaching the moon was achieved by the efforts of thousands of people, from the astronauts who risked their lives to the engineers. 
scientists, and technicians who designed and built the spacecraft. It was a testament to human ingenuity and determination. The legacy of Apollo 11 continues to inspire and influence the world today. It demonstrated the power of setting audacious goals and working together to achieve them. It showcased the potential of science and technology to push the boundaries of what is possible. The moon landing was a moment of unity for humanity, a time when people all around the world came together to watch and celebrate a historic achievement. It showed that even in the midst of a divided world, there were moments when humanity could unite in a common purpose. Apollo 11 also laid the foundation for future space exploration. It proved that humans could live and work in space, paving the way for the construction of the International Space Station and future missions to Mars and beyond. But perhaps most importantly, Apollo 11 left a lasting legacy of hope and inspiration. It showed that dreams could become reality and that with determination and innovation, we could reach for the stars. Dream of reaching the moon was not just a dream. It was a small step toward a brighter future for all of humanity. The end. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy the next piece. Please give a like and subscribe. Thank you.